Hey guys, this year marks the 40th anniversary of the fun hacker movie War Games, starring Matthew Broderick, Dabney Coleman, John Wood, and Ali Sheedy. It was released in June of 1983 by MGM United Artists. I'll bet you're going to enjoy this unique perspective on the movie because in 1983, when Broderick's character, David Lightman, was using a war dollar program, I was getting search warrants in real life to seize war dollars as a sergeant with the Austin Police Department. In Bruce Sterling's book, Hacker Crackdown, Law and Disorder on the Electronic Frontier, I'm listed as one of the first police officers in the nation to run a sting bulletin board to catch hackers. At the same time, I took every computer science class offered at Austin Community College. In this review, I'll talk about the storyline and how accurately the movie portrayed the hacker world and tell a few stories of actual arrests. To start, I want to play the official trailer to refresh our memories, and true to any Hollywood movie trailer, most of the best parts of the movie are given away. David Lightman was a master at computer games, a fast thinker. Oh, David! Maybe you could tell us who first suggested the idea of reproduction without sex. Your wife? Get out, my man. And a promising student at an old game Hi. with an electronic twist. Are those your grades? Yep. I don't think that I deserved it, F. Do you? You can go to jail for that. Only if you're over 18. This computer company is coming out with these amazing new games in a couple of months. And I want to play those games. Wow. What? We got something. He found the right code word to play the game. We're in. But it was the wrong computer. Shall we play a game? How can I ask you that? How about mobile thermal nuclear war? Fine. All right. <laughs> Their trajectory headings for multiple impact re-entry vehicles. What does that mean? I don't know, but it's great. All stations, this is Crystal Palace. I wonder if I should use my subs. 22 Typhoon-class submarines departing Petropavlov. What in the hell's happening here? Oh, my God. Shall we play? I have seven correction. Eight. That's eight Redbirds. Get on the sack. Get on the flush the bombers. The Russians are still denying everything, sir. Who are you working with? Nobody. I do not believe you. Over day, we have Soviet missile warning. Based on your arrest, pending indictment for espionage. Espionage. Confidence is high. I repeat, confidence is high. Cobra Dane, is this an exercise? Negative, this is not an exercise. Give me the president on the horn. It's still playing the game. It's going to start a war. Close up the mouth. Is this a game or is it real? War games. Playing soon at a theater near you. Shall we play? The movie opens at a covert nuclear missile silo control room where an Air Force captain played by John Spencer and a subordinate lieutenant played by Michael Madsen are arriving for their shift. Although I had a top secret security clearance later in life for conducting computer crime investigations in military facilities, I never had the pleasure of touring a missile silo. So I can't tell you how accurate this scene was, but it does resemble pictures I found on the internet. They get an alarm that requires them to launch their missiles, and we can see a foreshadow of things to come. The captain doesn't have the right stuff to turn his key, and it was here that I struggled suspending my disbelief. That's not the correct procedure, Captain. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Turn your key, sir! If the lieutenant kills the captain, then there's some way to turn both keys. Maybe he thought the captain would respond to the threat and turn his key. It does help the visual structure purpose of showing how serious the circumstances were. We get our first look at NORAD's control room. Director John Batham said they weren't allowed to see the real NORAD, so they spent a million to make this one up. This is the real NORAD. Batham said his control room was NORAD's wet dream. Pat Healy, played by Juanine Clay, tells Dr. McKittrick, played by Daphne Coleman, that the government officials have arrived. In the conference room, we get our first look at General Berenger, played by Barry Corbin, our loquacious general, festooned with World War II medals instead of those from the Korean or Vietnam Wars, chews tobacco and cannot hide his disgust for civilians in charge. Cabot, the president's assistant, is played by Ken Williams, and he wants answers. An argument ensues between General Berenger, who defends his men, and McKittrick, who wants his whopper to take control. 
Juanine was 34 years old when she appeared in this movie, but sadly passed away 11 years later from cancer. Daphne was 51 and was born right here in Austin. I think we ought to take the man out of the loop. I don't understand. What do you mean, take him out of the loop? We've had men in these silos since before any of you were watching Howdy Doody. It's Howdy Doody time. It's Howdy Doody time. Ah! This data center is similar to the one where I investigated a theft of software that the judge said could be the largest case in the history of Travis County. We meet the whopper copper Paul Richter, played by Irving Metzman who seems overly smitten with his awesome-looking Whopper. Paul, would you like to tell these gentlemen about the Whopper? <clears throat> well, the Whopper spends all its time thinking about World War III. I wouldn't trust this overgrown pile of microchips any further than I could throw it. And I don't know if you want to trust the safety of our country to some uh, silicone dial. Wow. I think I'm going to recommend McKittrick's idea to the president. You won't regret this. This next scene, we meet David Lightman, played by Matthew Broderick, and Jennifer Mack, played by Ali Sheedy. They were both 21 at the time of filming. Arcades were everywhere, a precursor to Dave and Buster's. This scene confused me. The clock says 8.20. Is that in the morning? Okay, I'm steaming with fries and a cup, right? I know teens will eat anything at any time, but an arcade serving a burger, fries, and a Coke for breakfast seemed a bit odd. David's late for class, as are some of the other teens, but younger kids are still hanging out. Anyway, it's a good look at how the kids used to live in the arcades. Uh, sprout roots? Oh, David! Nice of you to join us. The biology instructor, Mr. Liggett, is played by Alan Blumenfeld. He was 30 years old and now has over 193 film credits. He asked Jennifer a question to which she gives a flighty answer. Why do nitrogen nodules cling to the roots of plants? Love? All right, Lightman. <laughs> Maybe you could tell us who first suggested the idea of reproduction without sex. Your wife? <laughs> that answer gets him kicked out where he can view the school's current password. Without a user ID, how could several people log on the same time with the same password? Well, in some cases, the terminal's identification substituted for a username. You want to ride home? Yeah. And now we get a look at David's bedroom and his quirky, eclectic computer system. That, my friends, is an MSI 8080 computer. The keyboard in the movie is just a prop. That spot behind the desk is where an engineer sat with a CompuPro 8086-based computer, which actually controlled the screen, and he timed it to Matthew's keystrokes. What are you doing? Dialing into the school's computer. This is how computers were identified and hacked back in the day. The mini computer at the school dutifully identifies itself as a PDP 1170. It did not have a keyboard. Like early mini computers at the time, it was programmed with the switches on the front. Hackers got a copy of the user manual, which listed the default passwords that were often not changed. But the internet had just come into existence six months earlier. How would they find a manual? Once the mini computer was running, a programmer could use a terminal to input data. I worked at computer crime at a major chip manufacturing plant that required employees to log on with their first name, dot, last name, and they were assigned a serial number as a PIN. To help employees remember their PIN, it was printed on their employee parking permit sticker. I'm not kidding. They needed the sticker, I guess, so security could tell the crooks from the visitors. This is not an accurate depiction of a typical hacker's lair. Someone with more engineering or electronic proclivities like Steve Wozniak might have had an MSI, but not David. Woz cobbled together the first Apple computer, and he built his own blue box for freaking Ma Bell. I should clarify terminology. People who explored all the ways possible to exploit the Bell telephone system were called phone freaks. Programming computers were called hackers. A phone freaker took the name Captain Crunch because he discovered that a toy whistle included in every box of Captain Crunch cereal gave off a shrill sound right at 2600 hertz, the exact frequency needed to manipulate the phone system. There was some concern that real hackers would use the techniques learned in the movie, and in fact they did. The Hacker Quarterly 2600 was sometimes called the Hacker's Bible. It's named for the 2600 hertz, the frequency that might have began the freaking movement. I met a lot of hackers in 83. Most of them had an Atari 800, a Commodore 64, a Texas Instruments 994A, or a TRS-80 color computer called a Coco. 
prices varied on these micros, as many did not come with monitors. They were connected to a home television through an RF modulator. Dedicated monitors often doubled the price. During production of this movie, the Commodore 64s were sold for $5.99. The Atari 800 was being blown out at $165, and that's what I had on a cop salary. The TRS-80 Coco was $3.99, the ti 994 a was $5.95, and the Apple IIe, as you might expect, was $1,395, or $4,213 after inflation. Most of these, though, were found in schools. The MSI 8080? Well, it was advertised here for $5,995. Yow! $18,107 after inflation. That's the advertised price. Now, I've seen kits going for half that, but still, $9,000? Come on, not David Lightman. Of course, these were average prices, not including sales. Commodore was selling as many home computers as the entire rest of the industry, averaging 30 to 40% of the market. Now, while not accurate for all the hacker homes I'd been in, it served the visuals well for this movie. You can't do that! The micros wouldn't have looked impressive, but more worryingly, they would have shown kids that their home computer could become a hacking tool. I said change it back. Okay, okay. But after she leaves... I guess threatening to kill your captain didn't get you court-martialed back then. Turn your key, sir! It's all your fault! All your fault! At the dinner table, David is salivating over an ad for a new computer game. He decided to try to hack into the company so he can play those games. Movies always have to use fictitious phone numbers, and this is where we get an inconsistent mix of them. David will search for phone lines connected to Protovision using a war dialer program. One by one, it dials every single number in the target area and records the results. No answer, busy, human voice, answering machine, or computer modem. What city, please? Yeah, for Sunnyvale, California. The number for Protovision? Yes, yeah, that's 555. So here we get the standard 555 prefix, but David needs to dial all the numbers in Sunnyvale to find the computer he's after. The operator gives him more prefixes that did not exist back then in California. Seven, seven, six, seven, nine, For the war dialer, he has to put in the area code. Protovision, I have you now. So now they used the 311, which was a reserved number. It went along with 411 and 911 for special use. The war dialer program I had was simple and written in BASIC, but the more complicated war dialers steal long-distance credit card numbers. Hi. Jennifer has changed her mind and wants David to change her grade after all. What's it doing? Oh, styling numbers. After showing Jennifer what a fake modem tone sounds like, he admits he changed her grade after all. They answer with a tone that other computers can recognize. Sunnyvale? Isn't that expensive? There's ways around that. You could go to jail for that. Only if you're over 18. Is this gonna take a long time? I'd like to get my grade changed. I already changed it. Well, what did I get? You got a D. You gave me a D? No, you got an A. I was kidding. Oh, well, that's okay. David checks the results of the search and finds a bank and an airline reservation system where he books them two seats to Paris. Okay. Are we really have tickets to Paris? No, you have a reservation though. <laughs> doesn't identify itself. Connection terminated. How rude. I'll ask you for help. Help games. He's convinced this is Protovision. Patience. What does that mean? I don't know, but that's got to be damn.
They left a space between the lines to point out the global thermonuclear war. Oh my god. So these guys can tell you what that printout means? Yeah, they probably invented it in the first place. These are direct access storage devices, DASDs, holding 30 to 75 megabytes at a cost of $119,000 or $359,000 added for inflation. These packs on top are removable extras that can be swapped out. Uh, can you wait here? Why? Because these guys can get a little nervous. Oh, bye, man. The kids go to see Jim, played by Maury Chaikin. Maury is best known as Kevin Costner's commanding officer in the Oscar-winning Dances with Wolves. Sadly, he died on his 61st birthday from kidney failure. Malvin, played by Edward Deason, 26 at the time, and this is a shocker, he's typecast for playing nerdy characters. I really want to get in, find out as much as you can about the guy who designed the system. I don't even know the guy's name. Go right through Falcon's maze. This, boys and girls, is a library. It holds books. Lots of them. It used to be the only way to get information. This is Microfish. You'll still use these to research old articles from magazines and newspapers. And this is called the Dewey Decimal System, an official way to organize libraries. What is David sketching? Is that a cheerleader or is that a zombie? Or is it a zombie cheerleader? Hey, David, show Jen your etchings. Nice juxtaposition in the framing, Mr. Batum. No, it's not just some machine. He was into games as well as computers. He, he designed his computer so that it could learn from its own mistakes. That's him. That's Falcon. That's him? He's amazing looking. Can't you write to him or call him somehow? No, he's dead. He wasn't very old. Well, he was pretty old. He was 41. Oh, that's old. That's his little boy. Oh, yeah? No, Falcon's kid. Joshua. Can't be that simple. Wow. What? We got something. We're in. <laughs> it thinks I'm Falcon. How can it talk? Uh, this box just interprets signals from the computer and turns them into sound. Shall we play a game? Oh. Home computers could do speech synthesis, some better than others. Bell Electronics presents Play 17 Bomber. Welcome aboard, Captain. Entering Sector 1.2. I like this speaking spell. This guy didn't know how to spell quotient. Spell quotient. Spell leader. L. E. <laughs> I think I missed him. Yeah, weird, isn't it? Global thermonuclear war. Fine. <laughs> All right. Which side do you want? A little editing mistake. Russia is already selected. I'll be the Russians. <laughs> While Jennifer and David play war, Norad thinks it's real and all hell breaks loose. <laughs> Seattle! Yeah! What's a trajectory? I have no idea. <laughs> David? David forgot to fasten the lid, which ends round one of World War III. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir. We don't know how it happened, but someone on the outside said the type simulation to make a simulation. I didn't tell you to cut the line. Did I tell you to cut the line? You cut the line.
This Hollywood staple drives me nuts. Keep them on the line long enough to trace it, please. In 1983, I never had any trouble getting trace information from Southwestern Bell or any of the long-distance providers. I mean, come on, they invented automatic number identification so that people wanting to make direct dial long-distance calls could do so, and Bell would know whom to bill. We can see that the Whopper is recording telephone numbers. Isn't it common sense that in order to connect a call, you have to know where it's coming from and where it's going to? For three and a half minutes last I'm night, so the proud defense of forces you. of the United States went on a full-scale well, nuclear alert, how many months believing that the Soviet Union had launched a surprise missile right. attack. David starts freaking out while Jennifer calms him down. Are you watching the news? Louis? What am I going to do? They're going to come get me. I'm really screwed. Calm down. Shh, calm down. All you have to do is act normal, okay? I'll talk to you tomorrow, okay? Okay? Okay. 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 Greetings, Professor Bolton. Oh, my God. What is the primary goal? To win the game. Leaving the 7-Eleven with a drink half-filled, David is arrested by the FBI. This part is not realistic for 1983. I never saw the FBI in any investigation because you know why? They had no jurisdiction. It was the Secret Service that could do it based on wire fraud laws. The first and most famous hacker sting involved the Secret Service in Operation Sundown, two years after my sting operation. Back at NORAD, a group of visitors are on a tour. David is taken to NORAD. Why, I have no idea, except that it's a plot point for the movie. Okay, all set? Yeah. Go here. Well, we can find the password and take it out, but it might help to beef up security around the Whopper. The government officials meet with McKittrick's team, and this line got the largest laughs. I mean, have you gotten any insight as to why a, a bright boy like this would jeopardize the lives of millions? No, sir. He says he does this sort of thing for fun. What? Damn it, John. I want some answers, and I want them now. It's hard today to understand why that would be so funny, but back in the day, hackers were a real novelty, something that completely surprised everybody. And everything was incredibly wide open. Hacking into any computer anywhere was really fairly easy. Good morning, sir. Where's the lightning kid? In the infirmary, sir. All right, Sergeant, these aren't necessary, the handcuffs? No, sir. Yeah. Sergeant, would you tell the OD I'm going to take David for a little walk? This uh, machine over here runs his game program. Sure. In the real world, something this important would not be kept behind a glass case like some kind of jewel. Just saying. McKittrick takes snot-nosed David to his office for questioning. Who are you working with? Nobody! Why don't I believe you? But McKittrick has to rush down to the floor to settle something while David watches from the office. David spots the computer terminal and we get to suspend our disbelief again. Joshua. Greetings, Professor Holcomb. Is this a game or is it real? What's the difference? Joshua gives out a classified address for Professor Falcon. David is caught on the computer and locked back up in the infirmary. David digs around, finds a cassette recorder, and concocts an escape plan. Please, let me talk to Mr. McKittrick. I... Despite his MacGyver proclivities in the scene, everyone I know said, Can't you figure out da-da-da, da-da-da? David escapes the room and blends in with a group of touring the facilities. He finds a payphone and demonstrates one last trick for getting free phone service. Grab the whistle, David. Yeah? Jennifer, it's me, David. David? Louis? Yeah. Uh, listen. Contacting Jennifer, he asked her to buy him a ticket to Goose Island, Oregon. I, I need an airline ticket. I'll pay you back as soon as I can. Now, she surprises him at the airport, which was actually a Boeing airfield. Surprise! David, is this because of what you did with my grade? They travel together to meet Professor Falcon, about 50 miles southwest of Seattle. Falcon is played by John Wood, who was 53 during principal photography. 
He's flying a model pterodactyl or pteranodon. I, I never knew the difference. I'm looking for Dr. Robert Hugh. Oh, he's either of you a paleontologist. I desperately need a paleontologist. No, we're high school students. After this silly question, they convince him to listen to them after saying Joshua. Wait, I came because of Joshua. Meanwhile, Joshua continues playing the game. Crystal Palace, this is Delta Foxtrot 27. I have negative radar contact. Repeat negative Soviet aircraft. 27, this is Brass Hat. They're right in front of you. You're almost on top of them. Time after time, they see it's a simulation. Yet time after time, he wants to believe it. Out there, General, just blue skies. What the hell? How can you be so obtuse? You don't care about death because you're already dead. The professor is prepared for Armageddon. He's close to a major target, so he won't suffer when it happens. But the kids want to live, so they leave. Falcon hunts him down in his helicopter. He's agreed to try to talk some sense into those guys at NORAD. Let's go into a launch mode, close up the mountain. Boy, they love that ogre horn. This is Crystal Palace. We're closing up the mountain. You'll have to hurry. Jesus. This crash was a real accident, and they left it in the movie. Are you all right? Yeah, yeah, run for it. Major Lamb, lockout changes. Roger, lockout enabled. <laughs> It's a bluff, John. Call it off. No, it's not a bluff. It's real. How can you be so obtuse? Hello, General Barringer. Stephen Falcon. Falcon, you picked a hell of a day for a visit. Uh, uh, General, what you see on these screens up here is a fantasy, a computer-enhanced hallucination. But does it make any sense? Does what make any sense? That. Look, I don't have time for a conversation right now. How can you be so obtuse? The general decides to ride it out and not respond. We see a lot of drama and some cool but unrealistic graphics. This is Crystal Palace, you still on? That's affirmative, sir. Yeah, we're here. Jesus H. Christ, we're still here. We're showing impact. Stand down the missiles! Oh, Joshua has its own idea. He's going to launch the missiles himself. Joshua, what are you doing? Uh, the Whopper's not letting us back yet. I know. No one can get back on. Joshua's trying to find the right code so he can launch the missiles himself. It's all your fault! All your fault! Mr. McKittrick, after very careful consideration, sir, I've come to the conclusion that your new defense system sucks. They've taken out my password. Well, what are we gonna do? I don't know. Do you? I told you not to start playing games with that thing. It's games. So with all these scientists around, they're gonna let this kid play games. Let the boy in there, Major. Let's games. Tick, tack, toe. Order to disarm the missiles. No, no. Obtuse. Is it deliberate? One. Put X in the center square. No. By studying tic tac toe, Joshua realizes the futility of it. There's no way to win. Now we're hoping to apply that to global thermonuclear war. Near the end of the movie, the graphics people started getting sloppy and misspelled a bunch of countries. Greetings, Professor Falcon. 
Hello. Joshua? Strange game. The only winning move is not to play. How about a nice game of chess? Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this review of War Games. Because chemotherapy is kicking my butt, I'm exhausted. So instead of narrating them, I put a few examples of my hacker arrest down in the description. You can read how I pulled off the Sting bulletin board fooling even the editor of the student newspaper at UT Austin. Cheers!